ask for more. Pray that you would bless us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're a little bit late, so I'm just going to ask you to go right to Luke chapter 22. We've been going through the gospel of Luke for a little while now, and we're almost to the end of the gospel of Luke. Luke 22, as soon as I get my pages turned there. Starting with verse 21, Luke 22, 21. And we're going to talk about one word, although it's a large passage, and the word is humility. Aren't you excited? So... Many people say, and I agree with them, that humility is the key virtue of the Christian life. That if you were to describe Christ, try and understand him, it would be humility. He said about himself that he is meek and lowly. And he will express that here, and we'll be looking at what that means. Uh, It's a wonderful thing. So verse 21 But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. One of you 12 guys is going to result in my death in 24 hours. It'd be hard to share a lunch with someone like that, wouldn't it? And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined of him. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now, there was also a dispute among them, so they're arguing about two things. Who's your, who's your traitor, and which of us is the greatest? Now, there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Did anybody have that conversation in your, in your time this morning? Which one of us is the greatest? Hopefully not. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship, or literally assert dominion. That's the word there. They assert themselves over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. So there are two points here, and you might not catch it just in the reading of the they's and the them's. On the one hand, they assert dominion, they push their way, and then their title is also benefactor. But not so among you. On the contrary, he was greatest among you, Let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I shall bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father has bestowed upon me a kingdom. Let's pray again one quickly time. Lord, help us this day. Thank you for the time we have together. I pray that you'd help us, that we would consider the importance of and the privilege of being humble. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. There was an author whose name is John Erickson, and one of the things that he says about himself is simply, um, as he was studying on humility, he came to believe that most of the great men and women of history Those who have made the greatest impact on the world are those who are most humble. And surprisingly, he even includes that with those who are military geniuses. So, you know, you think of military people and the the general, perhaps, Miles, that you would be willing to follow into battle, or the captain who wants to call you and lead you to places where you know you're going to die that the individual you are most likely to follow is the one that you are convinced has your best interest at heart. He's not trying to take this hill, not trying to conquer this army, not trying to do whatever he's trying to do to make himself look good, but to do that which is best for those people around him. And he challenges us, and I want to challenge you through the Lord Jesus Christ today to consider how humble you are and... uh, Sadly enough, there is not a single person in this room who has attained to the kind of humility that we really ought to have. 
And so none of us is looking at another person in the room and saying, yeah, I wish he would listen, or I wish I, I would listen, or they would listen, or she would listen. Each of us needs to listen to Christ and become humble. And John goes on and talks about it, this individual who wrote this book, about the four reasons he says why it makes sense to be humble. And the first one is simply that it is logical to be humble because none of us is an expert. You could be an expert on this or that. You could be an expert on farming or mechanics or hunting or fishing or sewing. But if you're an expert on cooking, you're probably not an expert on fixing cars. And if you're an expert on military uh, schemes and ideas, you're probably not an expert on growing corn or grain or beans or anything else. And if you're an expert on technical issues, you're probably not an expert on something else. And so why wouldn't I stop and listen and let someone else share and have an influence on me if perhaps they're better than me at what they're doing? It is a logical thing and common sense for us to be humble because no one can be an expert on everything. The second reason he says it makes so much sense that we ought to be humble is simply that humility is beautiful and pride is ugly. And he tells a story about a man by the name of Sir Edmund Hillary. Anybody ever remember that name? Um, the former president's wife claims that she was named after him, and chronologically it didn't work out. So it, it proved not to be true that Hillary was not named after Sir Edmund Hillary, but she claimed it anyways. Um, Sir Edmund Hillary was, I believe, the very first individual who climbed Mount Everest. And so he was up and he had done his climbing, he'd come back down and he was taking pictures and encouraging people along the way. And some tourists came along and found him in the city and said, can we take our picture with you? And so he got one of his pics out from uh, what he had been climbing and he held it there so that he could show them, you know, this pic and they took pictures together. Just as they were ready to take the picture, a person in the crowd came out and stopped and said, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's not the way a person who really knows how to climb would hold a pic. And he walked up to Sir Edmund Hillary and he took the pic out of his hand and put it a different way and says, now that's how you should hold a pic, climbing a mountain. And uh, Hillary said, oh, thank you. And he took the picture and went on the way. And later on, he found out that this was the guy who had just climbed the mountain. Now, if it was me, or maybe if it had been you who had someone tell you something about the one thing that you are the best person in the world to know about that, you're an expert in, uh, I would have been tempted to tell him a thing or two. And if I told him a thing or two, would you have thought more of me or less of me? If I would have corrected the idiot, which he was, you would have thought less of me. The fact that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary didn't say anything negative towards this uh, person, everyone thought more of him. And so humility is a beautiful thing. Third reason why we ought to seek after humility is that humility is a mark of maturity, and it is the demonstration that a person is secure in who they are. So in other words, I'm, I'm not trying to prove something. I'm not trying to elevate myself. I'm not trying to make myself be anything better or different than I am. I'm just simply comfortable in my own skin. And so it doesn't matter what necessarily another person would say about me. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, excuse me, one, two, three, four. Um, he says that humility leads to a greater level of ability and development. So as I become humble, I'm going to be better at what I am or was than, than a minute before I talk to the individual. And so he says that humility inspires others to lead and it inspires others to grow and they want to follow you if uh, you yourself choose to be humble. Consider this about Christ. So I'm now going back into the text. That was my introductory ideas. When we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and look for the premier attitude or the basic characteristic of Jesus, could it be anything other than being humble? Now, I debated in my mind, and maybe you're debating in your mind, wouldn't the premier characteristic or attribute of Jesus be that of love for other people? And certainly it was. But how in the world would you love someone like us, people who are so unlovely and are, are constantly trying to correct Jesus like that, a uh, person tried to correct Hillary if you didn't have humility and wouldn't put up with idiots like me and you and others 
who don't really understand the Lord Jesus. And so I am convinced, really, that the key characteristic of Jesus himself was that of humility. It was the premier attitude. And we are told, let this mindset or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that comes from from Philippians chapter 2. And it describes the level of humility that he had. He started from the throne room of heaven, and he came down to earth, and he did two things, by the way, in the text. He emptied himself, and he humbled himself. Those are the two verbs that are mentioned there. By emptied himself, it literally means to deflate. Kanao, it's a great Greek word, and it means to take something that's big and make it small. If I took a balloon and I blew it up and held it in front of you, I would say, this is a balloon. If I deflated it and took all of the air out of it, would it cease to be a balloon? Still a balloon just as much as it ever was, but now we go from an inflated balloon to a deflated balloon. That is exactly what Jesus did with himself when he came to the earth. He deflated himself, not demanding, claiming, grasping after godhood, but was willing to come and serve. And so he deflated himself, which is what I need to do. And I would challenge you to think about deflating yourself, becoming less impressed with your wisdom or your personage or your knowledge or your abilities or your beauty or your skills or or intellect or whatever it is that we would claim that we think makes us special and deflate ourselves and remind ourselves that literally, I want to define humility. Humility is not making yourself less than you are because if that was humility, what it's saying is I'm greater than I am, but I want to appear to be less Humility is not making yourself less than you are. Humility is coming to understand what you really are and living accordingly. I'm really a sinner, a depraved person who's trying to walk with the Lord and and follow him, and I am worthy of nothing, and I have brought nothing into this world, and it's certainly certain that I can take nothing out of this world. And so if everything I have, including my health and my strength and my looks and my air and my food and my family and my life, if all of those things have been given to me and I will release them when I die, then what in the world do I have to brag about? Nothing, nothing whatsoever, no matter what I have accomplished. And so humility is not making yourself seem less than you are so that people can look at you and think that you're humble. It's recognizing what you really are before God. And then being comfortable with that, being happy with that, and living in the light of that, and living by grace. And so the two words that I said for Jesus, what was the first one? He emptied, uh, he, he emptied himself, deflated himself, literally kanao. And the second one is he humbled himself. Now, the word for humility in the Bible is a word that in Greek culture was considered ugly. Um, when, when John was writing this book, uh, John er- Dickinson, I'm sorry, I said Erickson, but his name is John Dickinson, in case you were looking for it. When he was writing his book on humility and he studied cultures and how they approached humility, humility was an ugly, awful, despised position. So the Greeks and the Romans did not like humility. They thought it was weakness, meekness is weakness, and, and they made fun of those people who are humble who would let someone else run over them. And he said, but something in history changed about the first century. Somewhere about in the middle of the first century, society and the world, excuse me, the world at large began to think differently about humility. You have any idea what might have changed the world's perspective or history's perspective on humility? It was clearly the coming of Christ himself. And with Christianity... Uh, John Dickinson says, says it like this. He believes that one of the gifts that Christianity gave to the world was an elevated sense or an appreciation of humility. And so to humble ourselves, it was in Jesus' day when he said these things, it was not a term of respect in any sense. Um, it was simply uh, something that was to be despised. But Jesus comes along and says that what we need to do is learn to humble ourselves. Now, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, I should have made you turn there. I apologize for not doing that. When it says that he emptied himself, which means to deflate himself, and he humbled himself, when he made himself as a servant, it's really important to recognize Philippians 2 doesn't say he pretended to be a servant. 
It doesn't say anything about, well, he, he put a different sign or name tag on his coat. He actually became a servant. That's the difference between how I like servanthood and how Jesus demonstrated servanthood. When I choose servanthood, I'm pretending. Trying not to, of course, we're all trying not to, but, but we pretend our servanthood when Jesus instead became a servant, it was exactly who he was. And it says in a text that he had the very morphe, which means the very essence of God. And that word morphe, and you can hear words in English that are related to it, that he took himself from being of the very essence of God and made himself the very morphe, morpheme of a slave. Meaning it wasn't just a dress that he wore or a robe that he donned, it was a characteristic of his life. And so his slavery, his servanthood was real in his life. Now Jesus taught about humility, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 9, verses 44, 46 to 48. Luke 9, 46. 9, 46. This is the first time that we begin to see him calling out his disciples to be humble. And I'm highlighting this one because this is earlier on in his ministry. This is when he was in Capernaum. This is when uh, they're ascending and they're beginning to think we're part of a great movement, which is this idea of the kingdom of God. And in Luke 9, 46, guess what happens again? And there arose a dispute among them who would be the greatest. So what this tells me is when we read about a dispute in Luke chapter 22, they still hadn't solved the problem or figured out which one of them is the greatest. They were arguing about it a year and a half earlier in Luke chapter 9. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, by the way, I, one of the, my most favorite things in the Bible is when Jesus answers the thought of a person. And he does it several times. Someone will be thinking something, and Simon, I have a question for you. So Jesus is answering their thoughts and he took a little child and set him by, and he said unto them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you will be great. Matthew 18 tells the same thing. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus called a little child, and he set him in the midst. Or reading from Mark chapter 9, which is the same account in Mark's gospel, and then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said unto them, if anyone desires to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. Now go with me to another place, Matthew chapter 23. This is another example of the same teaching from Jesus, where he's calling these proud and, and self-assured and full of themselves kind of people, that they should be humble. And so it doesn't just happen once. It doesn't just happen twice. It doesn't just happen three times. It happens all over. And this is Matthew chapter 23, verse 10. But you do not be called rabbi. Anybody know what the word rabbi means? We typically think that rabbi means teacher. Because it does, it was used that way for teachers, but it's literally a Hebrew word, a different Hebrew word, and it's the word great. So uh, when David went down to battle and he killed lots of men, the word that is translated lots is the word rav, many, many. And so when you saw a person who was a teacher and you called him rabbi, you really were calling him great one. But you do not be called great one. For one is your teacher, the Christ, or the Messiah, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father. And I think this really applies to some other religious traditions. I would call uh, a Catholic minister or a priest, if I see him in a setting, pastor or maybe reverend, I suppose, but never father. Because one is your father, he who is in heaven. Verse 10. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Messiah, Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And I have six principles of humility from the text that we've just read, and I'm going to give them to you, and they're pretty basic and pretty clear. Greatness comes from humility, or through 
Greatness comes through humility. Now, when Jesus taught this and said that these things are true, it isn't just that we will become great because God is going to overturn everything and take a weakling and a frail person and a failure and make him great. He's actually saying this is the way that it works in the universe. Truly, even if I wasn't a believer, even if I was a Muslim, just for example, as a Muslim, if I chose to be a person who would be a servant and would be humble and would, would know exactly what I was in this world and love and serve others and meet their needs rather than my own, I would become a greater person than I would have been had I been proud. And you can think of examples throughout the history of the world. Humility, and, and again, greatness comes from humility no matter what. Believer, non-believer, Christian, uh, whatever the case would be. If you want to be great, then you've got to be humble. Now, I've, I've got to stop because nowhere else in the lesson have I defined the idea that is it right or wrong to want to be great? Because you could begin to listen to Jesus if he says, be humble and be a servant, that I should never aspire to greatness, which would be completely wrong. Jesus is not downplaying greatness. He's not downplaying making an impact. He's not downplaying being the very best person you can be and having the most influence in the world and your family and others as you can. He wants you to pursue true greatness. Don't be uh, so eager to accept that plastic kind of fake greatness in which we think someone is great because they are bigger or better or stronger than me. You want to be great where? In the eyes of God. What does that look like and what does that mean? A truly great person in the eyes of God, which is what we're talking about, is a person who influences and directs and helps others and pushes them towards the kingdom of God. So in eternity, if you want to be great and you want to hear God to say, good job, well done, good and faithful servant, then this is what I need to pursue and follow after. Let me say this one more time. It would be an awful thing. It would be a terrible thing for Christians to begin to think that what I ought to be is mediocre because I don't want to pursue greatness. You've got to pursue greatness in the way that God has called us to it. And greatness comes from humility. Principle number two, humility is seen in treating those who are inferior as if they were Jesus himself. The illustration is, what does he take? He takes a little child and sets, him, sets that child on his lap, a little boy or girl, I don't know which it was. Probably were several children, actually, as I think about it. And he says, the person who is greatest is the one who views this child and treats them exactly like they would treat me, which means you see the value in a person, and a person's value and worth is not determined on their strength, on their age, on their height, or anything else about them but the fact that they are made in the image of God. And so to treat an inferior with the same respect that you would give to Jesus is a sign that you are obtaining to, or attaining to, is the correct word, you're attaining to greatness if you can treat others who are less than you as if they were Jesus himself. And so parents, your children, when you look at your children, yes, you have a responsibility to discipline and direct but I can't look at a baby or a child or a toddler, uh, whoever as inferior to me or inferior to anyone else because Jesus says I should treat them the way that I treat him. Number three, I must not seek greatness by trying to elevate myself over other people. How else would we cons be considered great in this world? Well, those who compare themselves by themselves, as Paul says, they're not wise. You know, comparing one another, comparing myself to you or you to me and saying, well, I must be pretty good because I'm better than the preacher or I'm better than that person is no better and no different than the two people that went out fishing. Remember this story. And as they were fishing, they came to a place where they were really finding just that sweet, Dave, what do you call that one hole? The sweet hole where all the fish are. Honey hole. The honey hole. That's what I, They found this wonderful honey hole where they're fishing and, and the two guys are saying, well, we've got to be able to find this again. Let's mark this side of the boat so that when we come back out here, we'll know exactly where we can fish again. And the other guy says, you dummy, what if we don't get the same boat next time? I mean, you, comparing yourself like that is of no value. And so I'm, I'm going to let you down and say, 
if you think you're a pretty good Christian, or if I think I'm a pretty good Christian, by comparing ourselves to one another, you're really sadly disappointed. Don't compare yourself to me or another person or your parents or, or even Paul the Apostle, if we could put it in those terms. The only way to determine greatness is not by comparing myself to another person, but by comparing myself to the Lord Jesus. Now, here's how he gives us that uh, illustration. He says, don't allow anyone to call you rabbi. Don't, don't uh, you, you know, seek t- to be given that title of greatness. Don't strive to be known as the teacher. And this is the way this looks like in the world today. Our Western society, American evangelical culture, is gaga over famous Bible teachers. And they're all over the place. And, you know, I I can quote the examples. John Piper says, John MacArthur says, this person says, that person says. Um, I attended the seminary of, of MacArthur, loved it very much. But one of the things that I won't do is I don't need to defend him. And I don't push him up as a person who's elevated. He's got ways in which he's wrong because he doesn't agree with me, of course. Um, that's the way I typically would say it. But he's just a person. And in our culture, we, I think we need to really draw back in on that and say that we're not going to elevate people as, well, this is what he says because he's someone special. Jesus says there's only one teacher. One person who is worthy of the title and the admiration of being called the teacher, and it is the Messiah. And he says, don't strive to be above your brethren, and fourthly, don't strive to be called father, those who are over others, because we only have one father, and what are we? We're all brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, on occasion, people will give a title to myself, and sometimes I look around to see who they're looking at, because my name is Jerry, and you're welcome to use the name Jerry. If you choose another name, you can call me Gerald. My mother calls me Gerald. Uh, If you want to use an official title, you're welcome to do so. But in reality and in the end, I am simply your brother, and you are either my brother or sister, and that's the way that we need to be uh, viewing one another. Greatness comes from humility. Humility is treating others, those who are inferior, as if they were Christ himself. Greatness does not come through comparing yourself or elevating yourself over another's. And those who hunger for greatness are setting themselves up for disaster. Those who who try to exalt themselves, what does Jesus say? They will be brought low. Someone's going to come and kneecap them. Don't know who, don't know when, don't know where. But God resists what kind of person? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so he pushes down on those heads that tend to pop up and think that they're better. And he elevates those who put their head down and raises them up along the way. And so those who are humbled will be exalted. And lastly, this is the sixth principle in all of these verses I've looked at. Those who are willing to serve and are serving are great already. It doesn't say that they will be great but he is great, or she is great. And so I want to give you some encouragement if you're a behind-the-scenes kind of person and, and you feel like no one notices what you're doing or maybe they do whatever the case is and you think no one gives you thanks or no one gives you appreciation. You just are serving those you know, three snotty-nosed little kids along the way. Jesus says it's a great thing. And how do we, do we define greatness? It's by impacting a person to know and love and walk with Jesus. You are doing that which is eternally significant if you bless other people. In Detroit a few years ago, there was three boys, three teenagers who were on a bus and they were trying to pick a fight with an elderly gentleman, not too elderly, middle-aged man, sitting in the back of the seat. And every time they made fun of him, called him names, things like that along the way, he just kind of dismissed them and pushed them aside. And uh, finally they gave up trying to pick on him And when he got off the bus, he pulled out his card and he handed them a card and says, hello, my name is Joe Lewis. He was world famous boxer. And had he wanted to assert his power, his authority, he could have dominated and destroyed them. But in his greatness, he served them in their foolishness and futility and taught them a lesson in what it really is to be great. Listen to what Jesus said, by the way, in other areas of his life in terms of greatness. 
When Jesus came to this world, he said this, I have not, or I'm sorry, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Which is a great characteristic of greatness. Not wanting to do what I want to do, but wanting to do what someone else wants to do for me. And this would apply not just in God the Father and God the Son kind of relationships. This would apply in church relationships. This would apply in teaching relationships. Can you think of any other relationships where this might actually apply? It would apply in marital relationships where we would seek to do the will of the other couple and not my own. Jesus says a little bit later, I can do nothing of myself. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteousness because I do not seek my own will. So he didn't come to do it, and he doesn't seek his own will, but he seeks to do the will of his Father. In another place, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, uh, whatever he does, the Son does with him. And then he says, if anyone wants to know his will, he should know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. And he's going to go on to say, but he who seeks glory of one who sent him, let me read that again. He who seeks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory from the one who sent him, that is the true one. One more place, John chapter 8 and verse 28. And when you lift the Son of Man up, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak those things. One more place, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges, and that is another. Jesus himself never sought his glory, never sought his will, never in any uh, particular place ever asserted those things, and neither should we. And with that, believe it or not, now I want to go to Luke 22, verses 22 and following, and learn just three more principles from the most significant text that we're looking at. In Luke chapter 22, verses 22 to 27, Jesus is telling the disciples that there's a traitor in the midst. He knows who the traitor is, but he doesn't take any vengeance on him. He doesn't really out him. He just warns others about him. And he uses that betrayal of himself as a teaching tool to encourage others to be more humble. And if I knew that there was a traitor in the room and we were talking together, it would be hard not to take action and not to prove him wrong. Or, or if you have an enemy or a hostile person who comes along and, and they don't like you, it would be awfully easy to, to want to assert your will and defend yourself. And instead, what Jesus does is he teaches us about humility. There are three things that we could say about the text, and the first one is simply this. Here's how the world runs. Now, he talks about earthly kings. Um, let me read it and then give you the principle. Verse 25, 22, 25 of Luke. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactor. Let's stop and talk about that for a minute. Here's how the world runs. The world runs through power and authority. And all you've got to do is look at the Senate, look at Congress, look at the presidency, look at our political system, watch the news, watch anything around the world, and you will learn and you, you will know that this kingdom, this world, runs through authority, through power. And when he talks about this idea of having lordship over them, it literally means to exercise power, to rule over a person, to lord it over, or to assert dominion. So he says, this is how the world runs. People assert their dominion over other people. And I don't ever want you to assert dominion over another person. The second thing he says about it is this is the way that the world runs, that they assert dominion. But secondly, those who assert that dominion, notice what they do. They are called benefactors. Now, you probably have never heard of this being described before. So, so let me make this clear so that when you read it later, you'll be able to understand what Jesus is talking about. He says, on the one hand, the world runs through power and authority, and people assert their dominion over you, and then what they force you to do is they force you to call them benefactors. So it's the same people who are the kings are the same ones who love the title ben benefactor. And the word uh, benefactor literally is good worker. 
and it's, it's an interesting word in the Greek language. It was used a lot in, in Greek culture, used, used a lot in Egyptian culture and other places for a king who would come along and say, oh, you, you want something from me? Then grease the palm. Or you, you want to get, you know, you want a, a new position, you want to be able to, to escape taxes, you want something. And it was this idea of bribing and manipulating and living like a Chicago politician. So I, I think my dad used to say one time that when you are elected governor in, or mayor of Chicago, or governor of Illinois, that uh, you went from being a private citizen to governor, and then what was the next step? It was always to go to jail. That was the third step in the process of your, your political system because they were always so corrupt that they were always... Uh, manipulating people and giving and taking bribes and things like that. And that's what he's saying that the world does when it seeks after or pursues greatness. They, number one, uh, try and assert authority over others. And number two, they try and manipulate their way to having others love them. And Jesus says, I don't want you to do either one of those. Don't assert your authority. Don't manipulate your way to greatness. But what you need to do, on the other hand, is simply do what he says, which is to view yourself the way God does. Let me go ahead and read that. Uh, verse 26, thank you. But not so among you, but on the contrary, who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. And then here's the rhetorical lesson, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but I need to say it now. Who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? In truth, it's typically he who sits at the table is greater than the person who serves. But Jesus is saying, I have turned it all around, not just so that you can manipulate the world to become greater. This is the way it really is. Is that he who sits on the table, yet yeah, I am among you as one who serves. And so great leaders are those individuals who treat others as superiors and worthy of themselves, and, and worthy of respect in themselves as the younger. Let me read that again. I didn't read that very well. Great leaders treat others as superior to them and worthy of respect and instead view themselves as the younger. So um, in my family, I have three older brothers. I'm the, the fourth child. I'm known as the baby in the family. And uh, I have experienced many of the the quote-unquote perks of being baby in the family. And if you are uh, the youngest one in the family, you can know those. But what you don't know is that there is another way in which you are always treated as the baby of the family. And there is a sense of inferiority. And so when I meet with my brothers and, and we're, we're viewing one another, I always am reminded personally that, well, they're older than me, they're smarter than me, they're wiser than me, they're greater than me. That's what he's saying that we should do. We should not only view others as greater, but we should see ourselves as inferior and younger to others. And secondly, great leaders are those who serve for the benefit of others. We need to quit trying to think that we could sit at the table and let others serve and help us. We should get up from the table and go serve and help others. And great leaders follow the example of Jesus and serve. Now, if you didn't have a harmony of the Gospels, you might not have remembered what just happened. But what just happened in Luke 22, in the verses that we've just read, is Jesus was at the table, they were reclining, and he looked around, and Peter's stinking feet were near his. I don't know exactly where the feet were. Jesus got up, and he disrobed himself from his outer clothes, and he donned the apron of a slave. That's the way that Peter talks about it. He put on that, that apron and he came and he washed their feet. And it was in the washing of their feet and drying of their feet that he demonstrated what he just taught here. This is the pathway to true greatness. And I don't want anything less for you all and from you all than, make, than making an, an eternal impact on the kingdom of God. And you can do that by doing what Peter said and what Jesus did, which is putting on the apron of a slave and serving others. It's, it's not a game, it's not a trick, and it doesn't even take 
the Lord to turn around your service and make it good. It is good, and it will have a greater impact no matter what. And if God blesses it, breathes on it, then all the greater in our privilege of serving him. Lord, thank you for the day and the opportunity to reflect on your word. We all know that this is a lesson we all need to hear. I pray that we would. Thank you, Lord, for those who have served and have humbled themselves, emptied themselves. Help us, Lord, to do the very same thing. Help us, Lord, to be like our teacher. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us to serve others and believe that their opinions are valuable and worthy and and greater than our own so that we can be truly great in the eyes of the Lord when we stand before him and make a difference in this world. We thank you for those great, humble leaders who have led in our country and in our churches and in our families. I pray for the husbands who are here today that they will maybe see again or for the first time or be reminded what it is to be a servant leader. It is to be like Jesus and lead your family to greatness. Thank you, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The Lord bless you. Go put it into practice.